So we're going to talk about um, Amazon's four pillars, and it's kind of interesting. We just finished a book. We just released the book, and the the sort of um, the subtitle of the book is "Even a Lemonade Stand Can Do It." We wanted to get across that idea that you didn't have to have these huge resources, that you didn't have to uh, be Amazon and have billions of dollars to make change and be effective. And so, what are these four pillars? I'm going to get right to it. Right, that's a limitation of 20 minutes. The four pillars are first customer centricity, which you will hear a lot about, and I will define better um, than just putting the words on screen. Continuous optimization, a culture of innovation, and corporate agility. Now, how do we know that these are Amazon's four pillars? Because nobody at Amazon ever told us, but it's kind of interesting. In 2009-ish, 2010, um, one of our friends was in interviewing at Amazon Local, and they sent her a uh, an email with this list of links about the company that things that she should look into before she came to interview. Um, and it's all kind of internal links. And there was this article that they linked to called The Four Pillars of Amazon, which is one of our early observations of um, these four pillars. So we know that somebody at Amazon actually thinks that perhaps these are their four pillars. Now, why Amazon? Right, because yeah, we know we're all scared of Amazon. We think of Amazon as this amazing, huge company. But keep in mind that in 1994, Jeff Bezos had to have 60 meetings to raise one million dollars. Right, he was an, it, it, This was not foreordained that this was going to be the big successful company. But um, as um, Warren Buffett says, right. Jeff Bezos and his four pillars have been pretty amazing. And Warren Buffett actually said, and this was a, um, just, a few, just a few weeks ago, really, um, that he's the most remarkable business person because he's launched things in B2B and B2C, right? He has a $100 billion B2C company. And at the same time, a $10 billion, right, Amazon Web Services, B2B company. But let's actually make it more extraordinary than that. There was a, 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 a recent article about the transformation at the Washington Post. Now, that's not directly owned by Amazon, but it runs on Jeff Bezos' four pillars. And they're very simple, right? Like, you're not going to argue with any of them, and that's good, right? And we'll talk about why, if nobody argues with them, not everybody does them in the next few minutes. Right. Now, this is my brother and I. We had started in this goofy kind of online business, and we were literally in a basement. Not a boiler room, but it was a basement. Okay. Um, back in 1994, we were already doing some digital stuff, and that's when Amazon came out, and we were not fans because we liked bookstores. Right? Like, where do you hang out except in a bookstore? I, can't, like, I'm, I, I still avoid bookstores because I can't walk out without a stack. Right? So. Um, that was, that was what it was, and it was not this amazing empire that they've built. And when they started, their competition was Borders and Barnes and & Noble. It did not look like a slam dunk. In fact, BarnesandNoble.com was a client of mine early on, and we said, oh, you should be able to beat these guys. But they made that really silly tax mistake of separating the .com um, and the store, and they could never figure out how to integrate it. And we all know the story of what happened to Borders. And Amazon spends more on R&D, just on R&D, than the entire Barnes & Noble sales. So we know how this story turned out. We know how the music business turned out, right? Tower, kind of a goner. And that's kind of, this whole kind of expected. These are digital goods and whatnot. But what's kind of surprising? Is it that they had the audacity, the chutzpah? We're in New York. I can say chutzpah, right? Um, they had the chutzpah to actually go after Walmart. But there's a key there, right? Sam Walton is famous for saying there's only one boss, the customer. And he can fire everybody in the company from the chairman on down by simply spending his money elsewhere. Well, that's pretty cool. And we have seen that from that story, Walmart is firmly within the eyesight, right? Like they're, they are in the target of where um, Amazon is going. And, and Amazon's already surpassed them in market value. Um, you know, they have 43% of e-commerce sales. Walmart's not doing great. Now, 
in the book, and you all got a copy of our book, so I'm not, I don't have to sell the book, but in the book we talk a lot about um, Walmart's founding principles and how they grew, and I want you to look at them when you get a chance. There were 10 founding principles, and out of those, if you really read, about eight of them are customer-centric. And after Sam Walton t lost the everyday control of what was happening at Walmart, those things changed. And that happens in lots of businesses, right? So this is us uh, circa 2004. It's me and my brother. Lots of you who probably never heard of me have probably seen Brian speak somewhere, because um, he's usually out there. Um, but this is us in about 2004, and this is the Overstock website. Big online retailer. Um, Patrick and I were talking on, the, um, on a computer one night. We were literally just IMing at like 2 o'clock in the morning. And I said, you really need to change this thing. And he said, really? I said, yeah, like right now. And we did that. And we became really, really famous. And we had a couple of bestsellers for conversion rate optimization. We're not in that space any longer. I'll explain why in a minute. But one of the really cool things was we gave them a 5% boost in sales. That equated to about 25 million bucks. And that's what started to be expected of conversion rate optimization. Until that time, it was pretty obscure. Nobody was talking about it. I can, I can kind of show you that that was the big change if we went on the way back machine and started looking at Google. The problem is that then people started wanting $25 million changes, right? And I can promise you that very few $25 million are available for swapping one image, right? Where nobody's that good, right? But we went around and we were talking about the 21 secrets of top converting websites. And I mean, we built a really nice business out of it. We, we established an industry. My brother started the Digital Analytics Association. And as we're doing these 21 secrets of top converting sites, we have still spent the longest amount of time with clients in a conversion rate optimization space, right? Nobody else had been in that business in 1998. So we're getting to the point where we have eight, nine, 10 years in doing conversion rate optimization, and we are realizing that it is a dead end. Don't tell people who are conversion rate optimists. They may get upset by, by that, but it is a total dead end. And why is it a dead end? Well, the dead end comes because you're optimizing Local, right? You get a local maxima. What we realized was that we couldn't affect the product, we couldn't affect the culture, we couldn't accept the, affect the service, and the stuff that often was like really critical, we couldn't touch. And so we would ask questions like, well, what's the difference, right? Like Amazon Prime members convert at 74%. If you look at the average conversion rate, this is a 2016 statistic, of the top 500 sites, on average, sites convert about 3.32%, and in the top 10, they tend to convert in the teens, right? So there's, there's quite a range there. But yet, what could be 22 times better, really? Are they 22 times better coders? Do they have 22 times, I mean, what's the deal, right? It has to be something more than what's on the site. It can't be just the free shipping. It can't be just one thing. And one of the things that, that really struck us is Amazon has a tribe, okay? Um, if any of you are Amazon Prime members and you sort of get a lot of packages in, 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 on your doorstep like we do, right? You just know that you go to Amazon and you just buy stuff, right? I mean, when they say 74% conversion, I mean, with me, it must be like 100%. I go to the site, I buy stuff, I leave, right? And I spent three to five times more Right, well, that's why they have averages, right? There must be people, but I, I spend ridiculous amounts of money on, av uh, on, on Amazon. Um, I should probably send them a 1099, okay? Um, and this subscription growth is huge, right? Prime is a membership. These people pay for a membership. They feel tied to it. They're not just paying for, for something else. And I've heard people throwing around the number that there's 85 million, and I've really done the research, and there's no possible way, by the way. We think that there's somewhere between 55 and 60 percent of North American households have prime right now, just in case you're curious. That seems to be the real number if you go ahead and do the math. But why is that? What does customer centricity really mean? Okay, so Jeff Bezos is, has this quote, right? He says, when things get complicated, we simplify by saying, what's best for the customer? And then we take as an article of faith 
If we do that, it'll work out in the long term. An article of faith from a data company, from an article of faith, right? Just think about what, what I just said. It sounds almost like an oxymoron. But there's a lot of this kind of thinking that, go, that, that goes on, these kind of messages that go on, and people really don't always know what to make of them. So you've probably seen the Simon Sinek talk. If you haven't, please do. It's magnificent. It's a TED talk. Um, and he talks about people don't buy what you do. They buy why you do it. And what you do simply proves what you believe in. So I've seen marketers talk about this stuff, and they'll go on and on and on and on and on and on and on ad nauseum talking about why they do things. This is why mission statements were written. And quite frankly, they're all kind of nauseating. The truth is that actions express priorities. If you tell me that something's important to you, like if you tell me that, you, that working out is important to you, right? I expect to see you in the gym, or I expect to see you running, or I expect to see you doing something. If it's not important to you, then you're not doing it, right? Your actions are what prove what's important to you. And why is that important? Well, Amazon says that the most important thing is to focus obsessively on the customer. Our goal is to be the Earth's most customer-centric company. When I hear the word customer-centric used, it always makes me cringe a little, right? Because you expect that it's a bunch of people sitting in a campfire singing kumbaya, right? And they're all kind of excited, and this is touchy-feely thing, customer-centric. Really, if you ever heard Jeff Bezos, if you ever saw him speak, if you've ever seen him in an interview, you know that this is not Mr. Kumbaya. He's not warm and fuzzy, right? He's a hardcore, very competitive guy. So what does he mean when he's talking about being the Earth's most customer-centric company? Now, in a longer presentation, I spend more time on this. But let's keep in mind that the big thing that they're talking about is they have more data on the individual customer than everybody else. When Walmart became really big, they became really big by focusing on the SKU. They knew what would sell, and they knew that they'd have it in the store, and they were always open to buy if that thing was ready to sell. Right? That was the big innovation with logistics and knowing the SKUs and where they sat, right? So they could move things around quickly and they could sell the stuff that people actually wanted to buy. Amazon built their whole business around the customer, around the customer data. They understand more about what the customer wants than the customer themselves most of the time, okay? And that's what they mean by customer-centric, but that's only one side, that's the data side. The second part of that is that they have this dedication to this idea called day one. And I'm going to show you at the end a little bit more about day one, but I'll tell you that day one um, is important. Jeff Bezos works in day one, in the day one building, and he talks about day one because it's always day one. They're always concerned with what can you make better. Now, we've already talked about continuous optimization, but continuous optimization, wasn't that the business I was in? I was in conversion rate optimization. Well, not really. Okay, what they have are these unifying principles, and what you're looking at right here, um, to the right, is the um, the flywheel that Jeff Bezos grew um, at a meeting where he had invited Jim Collins, right, the good to great guy, right, and they, they talked about how they would build that, and he literally built this live with in front of his company. Um, on the left of the one is the one we're talking about with the four pillars. But these are unifying principles. These are things that they believe deeply in. You can see in their actions, and they, um, they matter in everything that they do. I want to bring up frustration-free packaging. Why? So frustration-free packaging, is it customer-centric? Well, yeah, because when customers get this thing, they have a lot less frustration, right? I mean, if you think about this, if you get packages from Amazon, not a, this is not just this nice branding tape. I mean, we, I remember when we wrote Call to Action, which is a book that was a New York Times bestseller in 2004, people were thrilled because we wrote as a tip that you should get branded tape. But if you'll notice, the, the tape on an Amazon box comes right off. It doesn't open up by accident, but it comes right off. It rips real easily, right? You don't need an X-Acto knife to open it. The other thing about frustration-free packaging is that it leads to innovation. Well, what do we mean by that? Okay, so my brother decided to do this little experiment. He needed a, a, a flash drive, and he went ahead and ordered one. And then he ordered one from Amazon. No, this one is from, um, from Walmart. 
this one from Amazon. Not only can you tell the difference in orientation in the receipt itself and how customer friendly it is and whether, where you can manage the order and how it's, how it's well organized, but it's also innovation in there, right? So frustration-free packaging when it arrives, right, is easier to use, right? There's, there's the innovation is in that package. Not only is it cheaper to send, which makes Amazon more competitive on price, but it's also much easier than having to take out an X-Acto knife and do all sorts of personal damage in opening it, right? Well, so innovation and customer centricity, that's awesome, but does it cover the other things, right? Is it an optimization? Well, yeah, they keep optimizing the way that they ship these things. And is it agile? Absolutely. What's easier to, to, to do? Package that or, or stick a, a USB drive into that little envelope on the right, right? So when they do things, they look at these unifying principles and they say, does it fit that? That's a commander's intent, right? We just heard a little bit about the idea of intent. Their intent is really clear. Okay, and the reason for that is because Jeff Bezos says this a little bit differently. What he says is that a brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room, right? So if you're here, what are people saying about your company, right? Well, it's kind of interesting what people are saying because it depends on what kind of evidence you're leaving. And when we talk about a lemonade stand, I want to make this very practical, right? I've been kind of up here theoretical, and I want to make it very practical. There's a company okay, that serves um, Nevada and um, Colorado, right? It's called Gettle Air Conditioning. And they painted their little screws red, why? Because one of their beliefs was that if you service an air conditioner, unless you tighten up every single screw on that air conditioner, you're likely doing damage to their unit because it's gonna hum and rattle, right? And that'll do damage to the equipment. And they wanted to make sure that their technicians would see that they changed every single one. And so when you've had service from Gettle Air Conditioning, right, it has every screw painted red. That's evidence. Not only do their technicians know that they care, right, but the customer also knows that they care. Or the mini donut factory in Tampa, in Tampa Florida, and they've now got um, four, they're opening up uh, three new locations, they've, they've been around for about 18 months, and they make these little mini donuts, they make them in front of you to order. And what's really cool is that if a donut comes out and it's not perfect, they'll throw it out, and they literally have people like, what are you doing, you're throwing it out? And it's like they understand that if it's gonna be, it might go on Instagram, it might go on Facebook, right? It might go on Snapchat, and if it's not perfect, they won't serve it, right? So yes, are they wasting, but what they've shown through their actions is what they care about. Um, another one, through their actions, the Ritz-Carlton rule, and many of you have probably heard this, but anybody at Ritz-Carlton, even the, the, the cleaning people, right, the people who actually clean rooms, have the ability, if they find a customer dissatisfied, to spend up to $2,000 to make a customer happy. No questions asked. They're just supposed to do it because the intention is to keep the customer happy, right? So these actions are the ones that speak, not the words. And these things take a budget. Because I hear people talk about, we don't have budget for this, we don't have, well, if you're not budgeting for exceeding customer expectations, then you're doing something wrong. You are in a, you, you are in a slow death spiral. Because customers' expectations increase, and I'll show you why, okay? Well, first of all, most people don't realize that they're not meeting customer expectations. So Bain and Company did this great study where they asked executives of, it turned out to be 362 companies that responded, and the executives said, um, you know, are you customer centric? And 80% of the executives said yes. When they asked those, those companies' customers, 8% said yes. Now, Bain and Company called that a delivery gap. I just call that plain tragic. Right, it, what it means is people are deluding themselves and they really are not understanding where the customers are coming from. For instance, Lush, which is a, which is a brand that prides itself on what they believe. They put what they believe front and center, they put it in the store, okay? And I think it's actually a really good brand. But what happened to my niece is kind of interesting, right? People go out there and they open these things up and they put them up on Instagram, they talk about them, they're all excited, they've built this great brand. And part of their brand is about customers and being right. So my 
a niece who's 16 years old, right? And she's with her friend, opens it up, and she wants to smell it because it smells nice, and she's all excited. And she sees it, and it comes out like this. And so she calls up the store, and the store says, well, it's not the store who answers. And they say, come right back in. We'll replace it for you. She gets to the store, and they say, oh, no, that's how it was. Now, of course, my brother has a pretty powerful Twitter account and eventually got satisfaction, but somebody's actions weren't the same thing as what, their, as what the corporate beliefs pretended to be. Now, I'm going to ask you this question, right? If you've got employees, if you've got teams, are your customers meeting your best employee on their best day? Or are they meeting your average employee on maybe a less than average day, right? And that is the big difference when we talk about customer experience. Now, when we're talking about customer experience, most people want to compare themselves to their competitors. And if you're doing that, good luck to you, because here's how I think about it, right? If I've got to outrun Alan, OK, because we're going camping, I got to run out of that bear. OK, um, then we've got, a, we, we've got a problem. I may not be able to outrun him, but I only have to outrun him. We're not looking at outrunning your, the, the competitors. We're looking at outrunning our customers' expectations. So what stands in the way of those expectations? We have four things that nobody can argue with. There's nobody in the room who'll say, absolutely not. Don't be customer-centric or don't have right? None of those things. But there are four things. And one is an organizational focus. One is, that's not my department, not my job. It's how we look inwardly. Number two is the fact that we hate change, right? We're human beings, right? All organisms seek homeostasis, right? We don't like to change. And so it's really hard to do. The third one is this competitor focus, right? Well, our competitors don't do that. Why should we do it? And the fourth one is misplaced accountability. And, and being one of the first people to be involved in the writing of a, a book about web analytics and being a high metrics guy, I'm going to tell you that most, you know, that um, um, figures lie and liars figure, right? This is a real problem because I've heard people say, but we're meeting our numbers. The sales team's meeting our numbers or our stores are meeting our numbers. Well, the numbers don't tell you the reality behind them. They're not telling you the customer reality. How do I know that? Well, one of our, one of our big customers is one of the largest jewelry stores in the Bay Area. Um, it's called Shreven Company. And they built a $7 million store. They were all excited. And they were thrilled because they were answering emails and telephone calls within the day. They said, in our industry, that's good. Well, we moved them. We showed them a B2B study that said, if you call people within five minutes, it's really good. And if you move call within an hour, we have them now responding to almost everybody within 10 minutes. And it's had a dramatic impact on sales. I won't give the actual numbers of the private company, but it's, it's been millions of dollars in sales simply by looking at that. And I promise you that in the jewelry industry, that's not standard. And the reason for it is this. We keep talking about numbers. And I hear people talk about numbers because it's the, number, the, the language of business, right? When we talk about numbers, when we talk about cost of labor, when we talk about close rates, when we talk about revenue in general, it's always a number. But there's always a person behind it. And one of the real tragedies is that whenever we're engaged in analytical thought, the part of our brain that can do empathy shuts down, and vice versa. This is an fMRI study that actually shows that that's true. Well, that means the process is broken. We can't just keep talking about the numbers, although the numbers are very important. We need to get to the bottom of this, right? And so Seth, Bro uh, Seth Godin says, right, if it's a process problem, let's not talk about keeping trying to fix what we're doing. Let's actually fix the process and then move on to fix what we're doing. So we developed this process called Buyer Legends, and it's a um, customer experience design in an agile way. We're able to teach these things. If you read that book, which is an older book that we wrote, that we, wrote we say that within 90 minutes, you could do your first customer experience design session. Will you, will you master it? No, but you can be good enough in 90 minutes to actually make it valuable. And it works because it tells a narrative in a story base so that people can relate to it, so that it's not just the numbers. But are we ignoring the numbers? Well, absolutely not. OK? Um, and I'll get to that in a second. 
but we all know the value of stories, right? All of you have heard about the, the, the snow tires that were, ter were turned at Nordstrom's and, um, you know, and they're famous for having accepted them as a return even though they weren't really bought there, right? That's a story that tells things about culture. That's why Nordstrom's doing great. However, the customer reality data that we're looking for in our stories is available through a, a modeling language that, that, that we teach, right, that basically tells, gives you the customer reality data. So I'm here to ask you, is it your day one? If you don't know if it's your day one, if you don't know if you can be better today, I invite you to pretty please read the letter called Day One that, um, that, that was published in the 1997 shareholder guide that's in there every year, right? He republishes it every year with its day one. If it hasn't been day one for you, it could be day one today. You can be better today than you were yesterday. And if you want to know if that's possible, you just have to know the customer centricity is not about your intentions. It's about your actions. It's about something that you can see and something that you can measure. I invite you to take a look if you want. You can get a free evaluation about whether or not um, you're at day one. You could go to belikeamazon.com slash four pillars and check it out. <laughs>